All right, now I think we're live. Okay, great. And now I'm going to share slides. Okay. So, um, so today's lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to continue talking about uh, perceptron algorithm and moving on to kernel perceptron and then talking about kernels over persistent diagram. Okay, so again, this is not a lecture over sort of machine learning, but it's a quick review of the kernel method in machine learning. Um, so if you recall, right, uh, perceptron, the, the one small version I'm talking about here, it's sort of like an iterative algorithm where you fix number of iterations or some sort of stopping criteria. If you say fixed number of iterations, it means, you know, I run this for 100 times and then the ending line is going to be my linear separator uh, for classifying both classes. Um, and some stopping criteria usually is based on error, right? So you basically measure the error of the classification, uh, the basic classification accuracy, and then if it's reached certain accuracy, you're done, okay? Or you can use sort of like distances, some uh, sum of distances to uh, to the to the line, right? Uh, sort of, uh, you know, it's basically close to classification accuracy. But the algorithm itself, if you recall, is is actually quite simple, right? At every iteration, you are looking at uh, whether a point is misclassified or not. And if you have a point that is misclassified, you kind of move your classifier towards a direction to correct that misclassification, right? So if you recall the, the video here, you know, if for example, in this particular case, if this red point I just drew is misclassified, right? Then your tendency is to try to shift this line, which is a linear classifier towards the direction where it's misclassified, uh, you know, so you kind of, kind of wiggle it, Right. Of course, I'm going to do a very strong wiggling and I'm going to move it towards, for example, this direction so that this new point is no longer misclassified. But of course, if I do this, you know, the new point now, all this point are now misclassified and you kind of, you know, uh, of course, I just drew a very extreme case. Right. But in reality, you kind of just shifted very slowly towards the direction of the misclassified points. Okay, and then you do this until convergence. Okay, so now what we want to talk about is what you just saw, this particular algorithm here is a classic perceptron algorithm, right? You are operating over the original data space and you're looking at essentially the sign of your, this W defined the direction, normal direction of your se uh, linear separator, which is this line. And then X is sort of like the location and you're looking at the sign of this to decide which, you know, what is your prediction and which direction you want to move for your classifier. Now there's a kernel version of it. So it basically is called kernel perceptron, right? Um, is that now if I want to uh, express my weight vector, remember the weight vector in my notation is defining the direction of my linear separator this line, okay? And now I can just express it as a linear combination of my training points. And alpha is a number of times this particular training point is misclassified and that forcing an update. And uh, what's called kernel perceptron or sometimes called a dual perceptron algorithm is going through the samples as before, right? Because it's basically going through each of the sample. Is this misclassified? If not, move on to the next one. If it is misclassified, shift my, uh, uh, my classifier in a certain direction. So it still loops through the samples as before, making prediction. But instead of storing and updating a weight vector, W, which is the direction of the uh, linear separator, it updates a mistake counter. Okay, so um, so in this case, you know, if I just rewrite my original formula, which is the predicted uh, label is sine of uh, W transform X, and I'm replacing W by this formula right here, and then do some manipulation. If this is this is really looking. If I bring the summation outside, it's looking at each time there's a weight, of course. But then here, this is just looking at what is my um, xi um, 
you know, this is just everything here so far is just um, algebraic manipulation based on linear linear combination of uh, of uh, training data to express W. But then the next step, okay. Well, before I talk about the whole algorithm, I need to define something which is intimate to kernel. Is a uh, is we are talking about um, sort of replacing dot product in the dual perceptron by an arbitrary kernel. Of course, we will define what a kernel is, but for the time being, let's think about a kernel that is operating on two uh, points is defining some sort of similarity between them. And then the whole uh, idea of a uh, kernel is actually, uh, if I define a certain type of kernel, you can actually re-express it as a, um, as a inner product of a function map to each. And we'll see a visualization of it. This is a little bit uh, uh, abstract at the moment. But the idea is the whole, um, and we have a picture coming up. Okay, maybe in a few slides. Um, so the idea for kernel perceptron is we're going to replace a dot product, right? What is a dot product right here, okay? We're gonna replace that dot product with any arbitrary kernel function, right? So because once I replace that with any kernel function, then, then you are going to apologize for the noise in the background. It, can you guys still hear me? Yeah, okay. So um, when you replace this piece right here, this dot product right here by any arbitrary kernel function, then you can get effect of a feature map without computing this map explicitly. Um, let's make it clear very soon. So what happened is that if you see this picture here, this is a summation of, um, you know, I'm just going to write it here because I want to copy it. So this is alpha i, y i x dot x i dot x. Okay, x is a vector, and uh, this is this is the term here. Okay. And what all I do for the kernel perceptron, right? Remember, the, the, this is just a re-expression of the classic perceptron algorithm where you, know, you have this dot product term here. Now, instead of using this dot product, it's replacing by any kernel function, okay? So if you think about what is uh, the dot product do, it's kind of, you know, in some way, measuring the similarities between these two, uh, uh, two vectors. But in here, I want to, I can use any other function to measure it. So what's happened is that in the classic perceptron algorithm, which we just saw, it's trying to learn a linear classifier, which is this line. Now, if I replace what I highlighted in yellow with a kernel function, the kernelized version of the perceptron algorithm is to try to learn a kernelized classifier, okay? So again, what I said, a kernel, is a user specified similarity function over pairs of data points, okay? And we're going to see multiple different form of kernel. So it's just define a similarity measure between points. So, you know, uh, and what people use to use, uh, use a term for a kernel machine, it's a classifier that stores a subset of its training example associated with its example await and make decision for new sample by evaluating this term now, okay? So now, instead of evaluating whether my prediction, you know, what is my prediction based on this dot product, I'm going to base on this similarity. And that's really the minor change going from classic perceptron algorithm to kernel thing is to replace that dot product by this uh, kernel, okay? So what is a pseudocode, right? The pseudocode looks sort of exactly the same with a minor modification compared to classic perceptron algorithm. Right, so first of all, I'm going to initialize this weight to all zero. And then for a number of fixed iterations or until some stopping criteria for every single training point with a ground truth label, I'm going to look at what is its prediction. But now the prediction is based on my kernel function. And then if it's not matching the true label, then I'm going to update this mismatch counter, right? Remember alpha is how many times it's misclassified, okay? And then you kind of keep doing this until it converges, okay? So now what's happening is that 
so you might ask me like, why do I want to do this? The, the, the difference between the classic perceptron and kernel perceptron is a classic perceptron is a linear classifier, meaning that if my data is separable by a line, it works for this kind of data, right? So you can separate it by a line or in high dimension, it's a hyperplane. However, as I mentioned before, you can have data set that looks like this, okay? In order for me to separate this, I can no longer do a linear classifier because no matter which line I drew, I would not get very good separation between this because the true separator should be looking like this, okay? But you can't do that with a linear classifier. Instead, what you do, and you're gonna see a better animation of this, what you do in the kernel method is if you have data set that is like this, you are going to map it through my phi map to map all this point cloud to a different space such that in this space, all the points are now linearly separable. So through this kernel machine, remember what is a kernel? Kernel of two points now is going to be the defined this way, okay, right? And once you have a kernel that satisfies this condition, in your original data space, the data is not linearly separable, but if you choose the right kernel, they all of a sudden become linearly separable. Okay. So let's see, we're going to see an example soon, but now what is a common use kernel? Uh, I give you a few of them. The most commonly used kernel to measure similarity between two points are called Gaussian kernel, right? So we have a point two, point P and point Q, their similarity is measured by their um, distance squared over some bandwidth parameter, okay? What does this do? This is basically, later on you're gonna also see a better drawing of this. This is to say that, you know, if this term here, if I call it, uh, let me call it, uh, I don't know, parameter beta or something, and then this is when beta is equal to zero. So when they are very close, they are very similar. And when they are far away, their similarity kind of dropped in a bell shape kind of thing. Um, you can also have Laplace kernel. So it's actually, you know, compared to Gaussian kernel, it's just their distance over some bandwidth parameter where the Gaussian is those parameters squared and using square distance, okay? And then there's also, other type of kernel, which is called polynomial kernel of power R. So when you measure a two points, again, those two points can be high dimensional point. Uh, you are looking at um, uh, their inner product plus some parameter to the power of R, right? The list of kernels you can use is sort of, there's a really large number of those, um, but the most commonly used ones, I would say, you know, my favorite one is always the Gaussian kernel. There's also other kernel which I'm not going to give you the formula, but something called a Bohr kernel. So, you know, if you think that this is how Gaussian kernel looks like, a Bohr kernel basically looks like this. Okay. A Bohr kernel is basically say that the similarity is one for a range of distances and it just drops to zero outside. So that's called a Bohr kernel. And then there's also called a triangle kernel. Well, by definition, triangle kernel looks like this. Right, so within that triangle area, uh, you know, when the distance is zero, they have the maximum similarities. And then when the distance decrease between those two, they kind of decrease in a sharp way and then all of a sudden it goes to zero. So sometimes you can probably approximate a uh, Gaussian kernel by a ball kernel or a triangle kernel. But the Gaussian kernel has a really nice property is that um, um, it's, it's, it's what's called positive semi-definite. Um, and then when we talk about what's called RKHS, right? Uh, it's what's called reprodu reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Uh, you know that when your kernel is a Gaussian kernel, you're gonna have a lot of nice properties. Um, they have better properties than Bohr kernel and triangle kernel, okay? All right, so these are the kernels, but let's look at how they work. Okay, so remember I said, if you look at this point cloud, right? The red point and the blue point, I cannot run the classic linear perceptual algorithm on this because I cannot find a good linear separator between them, 
But what's happened is once you map this point through some map phi, you know, then you can actually map the blue point and, uh, you know, in that space, you can map them to point cloud such that there's a linear classification. Okay. So really the pers kernel perceptra algorithm is basically try to do a linear classification in this space, in the, in, in the kernel space. Okay. All right. So, sorry. Okay. So this is sort of the, how the algorithm looks is only nine seconds. Well, it's actually allowed me to play. So this is really running the kernel perceptron algorithm. It's trying to, you know, and then that's the end of it, right? So it's, it's if you see that line, that line is still running the perceptron algorithm and it's actually moving essentially this linear classifier in the kernel space, okay? All right. Okay, so, all right, so what we're going to do now well, is- Well, not an easy quiz. To show you the answer, what we're gonna do oh, is we're going what? to calculate all these two equations, x plus y, <laughs> x times y, and x squared plus y squared at each one nope. of them. Okay, not enough YouTube for the day. Okay, so now I would like to move on to the thing. Actually, this is a good time to break. Let's break for five minutes. And if you have any questions, let me know. Um, and we're going to move on to talking more about kernel and uh, and hopefully touch base on kernel over persistent diagram. Okay. So uh, maybe do some leg stretches and we'll be back at 945. <laughs> 
All right. Okay, let's resume the lecture today. Um, so we just saw a bunch of sort of kernel perceptron thing. Let's look at the kernel method, right? So I'm going a little bit in depth into uh, sort of kernel method. So again, as I said before, our kernel is a similarity measure between a pair of points. And in this particular notation, I just want to emphasize that points are indeed dimensional space. So they can be potentially high dimensional. And, um, and it's non-negative. And then the more similar the points are, the more higher value they are, right? So higher it is, the more similar they are. And then I'm just saying that, you know, for a pair of points in d-dimensional space, it's mapped to a non-negative real number. So as I mentioned before, um, Gaussian kernel is one type of really nice kernel and it has what's called positive definite kernel. Um, and then if you, if I drew the picture, uh, the Gaussian kernel, which is this one has a shape of this where my, you know, if, if I'm, if my, and one way to draw it is that I'm looking at the distance to a particular point X. And uh, if, if my P is equal to X, you are basically as a highest similarity. Okay. So Gaussian kernel looks like a bell shape. The triangle kernel looks like a triangle. The ball kernel looks like a like a ball, as I just described. Now, this is really what kernel methods works. And in the original space, let's say on the left is my original data space, and the right hand side is sometimes what people people call feature space. But sometimes, of course, the word feature is overused. But let's for the time being call the space it mapped to a feature space. So. This is really one picture I want to show and with a very concrete example about how to map my data point to a feature space. My original point cloud is a point cloud that is red point uh, with one type of label and then blue point with another type of label. And in the original space, they are like a two dimensional point cloud. They are positioned in sort of a diagonal fashion. So you know that in this space, no matter what I do, there's no linear classification between these two uh, classes. So I can't really linearly separate them. But I can design a very simple map, phi, right here, where the definition is just to say, I'm going to map this to be, if I have coordinates, I should have have some separator. Now I'm a little bit confused how exactly I mapped it. Um, I'm basically doing some multiplication of my coordinates. So, you know, if it's, um, 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 so for example, all the red points through this map, sorry, I need to look it up a little bit carefully. I think there's some separator between this. I think it's, um, I don't want to really do this, but let me just put a separator here. Um, this might not be the most correct one, but it's a cleaner combination of those. <laughs> you think about how I'm going to separate this multiplication into three chunks. But one way to match this is I'm going to match the coordinates x1, x2 of a single point to be a three-dimensional uh, point cloud. And depends on how I'm going to choose it. And I think this map is fairly easy to do. I actually think, no, sorry. I think it's actually, this map should be x1, x2, x1 times x2, I think. Okay, so maybe maybe there's a flip of uh, flip of signs, but the idea is with a map like this, I map it to from a two dimensional space to a three dimensional space, but all of a sudden I can linearly separate those points. All right, so um, oh yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. So for example, if I have a point here, which is say this is minus two minus one two. And then what I'm going to map to is minus one, two, and then multiplication minus two, right? So it's minus one, two. Ah, there's still going to be a little bit uh, sign shift. Uh, but the idea is you can now make them into a linear separable thing, okay? And what happened is, you know, the picture I want to show is also when I go from a two dimensional space to a higher dimensional space, the concept behind a kernel method is what used to be not linear separable is going to be linear separable in a higher dimensional space. 
Okay, that really is is a uh, is 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 what the, what 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 the use of the feature space is by bringing my data to a higher dimensional space. They become linearly separable. So. Now I'm going to do a small shift of gear to talk about persistent diagram, then we're going to come back to the kernel method again. So, you know, if I want to give you a taste of it, is that I would like to, you know, remember kernel is compare the similarity between two points. Um, if I if I replace the points by persistent diagram, the kernel is measuring similarities between persistent diagram. Okay. But in order to talk about similarity between persistent diagram, let me first talk about distances between persistent diagram. Okay. So that's what persistent diagram. So if you recall this picture as before, let's say the the bottom part is a rips complex. Um, I have a collection of points, in this case, five points as before. And I'm going to go to sort of looking at uh, growing up balls and looking at how the you know, component appear, disappear, how does a loop appear and disappear? And I can do this by looking at uh, simplicial complex filtration, right? So again, if I look at the second line, line B, I can say, oh, well, at this point, I have five vertices. They are all born at time zero. So those corresponding to all this five zero dimensional barcode, right? And then at time two, nothing changes at time 2.5, you know, the, the green component merge with the red component and dies that corresponding to the end of the first bar, which corresponded to the birth and death of one of the component, the green component. The orange bar is about birth and death of the orange component. Blue is the birth and death of the blue component and so on, right? So I have, I have five points. So by sort of looking at persistent homology computation, if I have five points that's born giving birth to five component, then four of them um, you know, are sort of disappeared at radius uh, 3.7. And then this is also following that at radius 4.2, that is where the birth event happened, right? If you look at the simplicial complex, this is where the edges connect and forming a loop. That is a birth time of this thing. And its death time is when the triangle comes in. Oh, the death time is when the triangle comes in, it gets filled in. So that is when the loop disappear, right? So this, this thing here uh, in C, what I just drew is sort of the barcode. And if I represent it as a vector, it's basically there's a component born in zero, uh, disappear at 2.5, component at zero, disappear at three, uh, zero, uh, 3.2, 0, 3.7, and then 0, and never disappear. That is all my dimension 0 persistent homology. And dimension 1 persistent homology, I have a loop that is born at 4.2, disappear at 5.6, right? So this kind of notation is actually what you see in the common line for Ripser. And if you run the online version of Ripser, you get the barcode visualization. Okay, so this is one way to draw those vectors is by this bars, right? The one endpoint is a burst time, one endpoint is a death time. That's called a barcode. And the same information can be encoded by something called a persistence diagram. Okay. Instead of plotting those vectors using bars, it's going to replace each point by a point in a two dimensional plot, right? So this is this is really R2. I'm just going to do points, right? The, where the first birth time is the x axis and death time is a y axis. So in this case, all the zero dimensional features or the components, they all are, they all lie along the y axis because in this case I'm using either rips or checks filtration, the points are always born at zero, right? The component born at zero. So all those points is lie on the y axis for zero dimensional features. And then the one dimensional feature is born at, you know, x axis 4.2, y axis 5.6. And then it's this is sometimes called an off diagonal point. And then those are sort of points on the on the y axis. And what's interesting about it is that actually once you have this point, what is a persistence, right? Remember the persistence of a feature, zero dimensional feature, or one dimensional feature is always the death time minus the birth time. Okay, so basically the lifespan 
of my feature. So in this, in the barcode scenario, it's a length of the bar corresponding to the persistence. The longer the bar it is, the more persistent it is. Of course, I have this bar, red bar that goes to infinity, right? So it has infinite persistence. Same thing here, I have the infinite persistence one, which is zero goes to infinity, of course, to for visualization purposes, I'm going to do it <coughs> not exactly at infinity, but at some point that is closer to the boundary, <coughs> excuse me, to denote that this point right here is a point that goes to infinity. And the distance from the point, the distance from the point to the diagonal, right? This distance, not this distance, but this distance is basically my death time minus my burst time. And that corresponding to the persistence, okay? So in the barcode scenario, the length of the bar is my persistence. In the persistent diagram scenario, like which is a different visualization, um, the distance to the sort of vertical distance to the diagonal is my persistence. So again, if you look at this, this point here has the longest persistence because it's 3.7, right? Among all the finite features. Okay. So now, Imagine I have two barcode or I have two persistent diagram. I want to measure their distance. Okay, so distance kind of captures similarities between them. So let's define what the distance are. Um, well, first of all, before even I define distance, I need to talk about, you know, the algorithm, just a quick recall, right? Remember how I'm going to compute uh, the persistent homology is looking at a filtration, and we've done this before, right? There's a reduction algorithm. After reduction, you look at the lowest ones in the diagram, and that gives you the barcode. Okay. Now, the understanding of what is the distance on the persistent diagram is directly related to talking about stability of the persistent diagram. Basically, the idea is if I actually perturb the function value. So when I say function value, I'm literally seeing that the label I'm assigned to them. Remember I said vertex one show up at time one, vertex two show up at time two. That is my function I use in here. But if I perturb the function, if I perturb this function a little bit, I'm just perturbing the ordering of it a little bit. For example, if I perturb, you know, function value when, where the, for example, I said the edge seven shows up at time seven, but instead, I'm going to say this particular edge is going to show up at time 7.5. That is one particular perturbation to the sort of the function defined on this uh, simplicial complex. So that's one type of perturbation. And then, um, of course, I can also perturb it to say, OK, if I perturb the triangle in yellow, instead of showing up at time 11, it's going to show up at time 10.5, OK? Then what's going to happen is that if I perturb this sort of function on the simplicial complex a little bit, which define the filtration, it might change the filtration a little bit, which then will change the persistent diagram a little bit. Okay. But the argument is that if my perturbation of the function is very small, then the persistent diagram does not change much. Okay. So the, the, the question is, why do you even care about this, right? This is essentially a notion of stability is to say that if I perturb the function on the simplicial complex only a little bit, my persistent diagram doesn't change much. But if you think careful about it, this is actually very important if I want to do classification, right? What that is saying is that if, if my data only perturb a little bit, persistent diagram is going to be close. If my data perturb a lot, the persistent diagram is going to be very far away. Then I can use these distances to cluster my persistent diagram, which is then corresponding to the clustering of my original data. Okay, without this stability, you cannot really talk about using this kind of thing for uh, classification or clustering uh, purposes. Because if you have a descriptor where a tiny epsilon perturbation changes the you know changes the signature drastically, then you can you can no longer in some sense use it for classification or uh, clustering thing because you have no stability with respect to the signature. Okay? So be for essentially for persistent diagram to be a useful signature, you want this sense of stability. So, okay, so the formal definition, right? So now I showed you a bunch of pictures, the formal definition, 
it says that the persistent diagram is a finite multi set. This is a typo multi set of points in the extended plane. Okay. Um, and to simplify the definition of the results, we also add infinite many points on the diagonal, each with infinite multiplicity. Okay, so what do I mean by that? When I say, first of all, multi set, that means if I have a point in the persistent diagram, there might be multiple copies in the same location. Okay, so I mean, it's not surprising, right? Because if you remember, in the in the situation, remember one of the Ripser example I have. You know, I start with a bunch of uh, four points over the corner of a square. You know, at this and at the radius one half, all of the four edges shows up, which basically corresponding to the barcode of the same length, right? If this is a barcode, there's a three uh, zero dimensional bars of exactly same lengths. If I match that to the persistent diagram, it just means in the persistent diagram diagonal, you know, in this case, it's all boy at zero, there's like three copies at that point. So that's what I mean by multi set, right? Because your persistent features may have exactly same birth time and death time. So you have multiple copies. The second part why I define persistent diagram is not just looking at those points that, you know, in this example, match those points to the diagonal and uh, off diagonal, oh sorry, off diagonal and on the y axis. It also says that if I, you know, for technical reasons, I'm going to also include this diagonal as part of my persistent diagram. So this diagonal contain infinite number of points. But if you think about each of the points on this diagonal, it's basically has a burst time. Let's say this is a burst time of three and this time of three, which means the persistence is equal to zero, right? But so it's sort of is kind of born and die at the same time. So it has zero persistence. So it doesn't, it's not a very, even if I include those points on the diagonal, it actually doesn't change like sort of my signature of my shape because those have zero persistence, okay? And now, I mean, we're going to use this notation diagram zero uh, subscript diagram one to correspond to uh, this is zero dimensional persistent diagram and this is one dimensional persistent diagram. So, and notation wise, this is what's called extended plane uh, is, is that I'm going to add, um, if I have a real line, I'm going to specify is it going to include plus minus infinity squared. Okay. Um, and, you know, to be fair, the delta, which is the symbol, corresponded to the diagonal. So now, if I have two persistent diagram defined this way, the first type of distance is called bottleneck distance. This is actually the one of the first distance people define for the persistent diagram. So now if you imagine persistent diagram is a bunch of points in this extended plane. And, um, and first of all, I'm going to define a L infinity norm. So you have two points, right? Two points, two dimensional points. Their L infinity norm is a maximum distance across one of those dimensions. So if I have points, you know, this is my point X, this is my point Y. If I look at the distance along the X axis, it's this length. Their distance between the Y axis is this length. Then L infinity distance is the longer one, okay? So I think L infinity is also called, sometimes called Manhattan distance or tax cap distance, right? Um, it's looking at sort of uh, the longest distance in a particular dimension. Uh, I think now, the Manhattan distance would be the sum of x. Oh and yeah, y. you're right. Sorry, you're right. Thanks for the correction. Yeah, the the the, the it has to be yes, it has to be sum. So it's not that's actually L one. Sorry, L one is a sum. <laughs> Good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the correction. Mean, All right. So now you need to go around the corners. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's also tax cap because if I want to go from location A to location B, A B, I need to go y-axis and x-axis so tax cap is actually l1 all right so now if i talk about l um sort of uh bottleneck distance i'm using uh using w infinity to denote it it's basically looking at a matching between the points and then looking at the matching that minimize the l infinity distance okay so 
this symbol here means that it's I'm going to create a bijection between the points in the two diagram. And then I'm going to based on a particular matching of points. So bijection, let's say it's a matching, a particular matching of the points from the first diagram to a second diagram. I'm going to look at the worst case L infinity distance between them. And I'm going to minimize that over a number of matchings. Okay. So it's sort of like a min max argument. And how does it look like? Okay. So in this case, I'm going to say, well, I have a, persist uh, a, a persistent diagram that is only the blue points. And I have a persistent diagram that is only the uh, red points. And when you are doing this matching, what's happened is that for the off diagonal points, most likely they're going to try to find sort of uh, one possible nearest thing to match to. But remember, this has to be a bijection. So for example, you know, this blue point mapped to this red point, this blue point mapped to this red point, and then this blue point mapped to this red point, right? So you kind of, you are looking at your nearest neighbors in the off diagonal space, uh, but if your neighbors already matched, then you have to match to somebody else, right? So it's not a many to many matching, it's like a bijective matching. But the other things, remember for technical reasons that my persistent diagram is going to include my diagonal. So what's going to happen is that for points very close to diagonal, what does that mean? When points is very close to diagonal, they have very low persistence. They're really just noise, right? So, so in a sense that, you know, when they are sort of really noisy, instead of matching to each other, for example, in this case, instead of matching this blue point to this red point, I'm going to match it to a projection, like a uh, orthogonal projection onto the diagonal point. So basically the blue point now it's matched to its projection onto the diagonal. And this projection is considered a persistent diagram from the red function, right? So this is sort of like how this matching looks like. And if this gives me an epsilon distance, which means among all the pairs I have matched, right? I'm going to, so this is my particular matching. And let's say this is my optimal matching. Among this optimal matching, the, 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 the maximum pairwise distance. Basically, if I look at a best possible matching and the longest distance among all those pairs is going to be my bottleneck distance. Okay. And another way to think about it is that if, if epsilon is my bot bottleneck distance, we can kind of do a, a, a square of uh, sort of length to epsilon surrounding all the blue point. And there is always a red point that belong to that square. Okay, that's another way to kind of imagine what does this epsilon distance mean is that, you know, there for every single feature from the blue diagram, there is a red feature that it's matched to. Okay, so this is bottleneck distance, and then this leads to the first stability result with respect to the persistent diagram. So remember, I have one way to build my filtration is to have a monotonic function defined on my simplicial complex, right? And then this monotonic function is such that if I have two simplices where one is a face of another, then the, the, the face of a simplex has to show up early. Right, this is really the foundation of building a filtration. Um, now, if I have two function defined on the same simplicial complex, f and g defined on the same, same simplicial complex, and I'm going to define L, L infinity distance again between these two function by looking at the worst functional difference across all simplices. Right, so for each of the simplex in my simplicial complex, there's a function f, there's a function g. I'm looking at difference, and I'm going to look over the largest difference across all simplices. So now the stability theorem is saying that if the if I have two functions defined on the same simplicial complex, which give rise to sort of a filtration, which give rise to persistent diagram, if the distance the bottleneck distance between their corresponding persistent diagram is upper bounded by the distances between those two functions. So what does this mean? In this example, I showed you 
if I perturb my function going from F, so the black is my function F, and then the blue is my function G, right? My F is all the simplices, one, two, three, four, five, until 11, has a function value, one, two, three, four, five, until 11. My function G is to perturb one of the edge from a function value seven to 7.5, and one of the triangle from a function value from 11 to 10.5, okay? If I just going to make a quick guess, what is the L infinity distance between F and G? I only perturb. What's that? 0.5. Exactly, right? Because there's only two simplices where I perturb the function value, <coughs> and then the change of that function value is 0.5. Okay? So now the stability is telling me if I compute the persistent diagram of F, which is exactly this reduction, versus computing the persistent diagram of G, which is a small modification of this reduction, perhaps, their bottleneck distance between the corresponding persistent diagram is at most 0.5. So all that is saying, this first stability result is saying that if I perturb my function, if this is a perturbation, if I perturb it by some epsilon amount, then my persistent diagram measured by bottleneck distance is only going to change with respect with like epsilon amount. So if epsilon is very small, it means that if I have two functions defined on my underlying simplicial complex and I only perturb the function a tiny bit, it means that the persistent diagram only change a tiny bit. And that is exactly the type of stability result you need for clustering and uh, classification tasks. So that's a first stability result, okay? And now, wow, I'm actually doing quite well. Any questions? This is the first time I'm ahead of my schedule. Any questions so far? So in the part where you were comparing two um, persistent diagrams by projecting the features onto the diagonal. Yeah. Um, how is it that both these diagrams have the exact same number of features? Is that? Ah, so that's exactly, you know, it's a good question because the way I drew it, I actually, the real diagram without considering diagonal in the blue, how many points does it have? It has one, two, three, four. It's actually only have four points. The red diagram has actually five points, right? One, two, three, four, five. So at the beginning, when the number of features from both diagram is not the same, you know, if I want to create a bijection, the extra point has to map to the diagonal. So I need to create a duplicate of points in the diagonal, right? If I want to match four points to five points, the best case scenario I can do, actually this, this is not the best case scenario in the sense that Actually, only three among each of those points are mapped into each other, and then the rest is mapped to the diagonal, right? So let me start from the beginning. If I'm thinking about matching, okay? If I'm thinking about matching, and I'm going to just draw it. Oh, I shouldn't use red, but let me just do it right now. So let's say this is my red point I just have. The red, the red persistent diagram has five points, and then the blue persistent diagram has four points. Okay. Now, remember, I need to create a bijection and then the bottleneck distance is, is, is looking at all possible. Let me just write it here. It's an inf soup, so mean max over all possible, uh, well, actually I shouldn't use gamma, of possible matching and looking at the soup of the matched point, okay? So if I fix a particular matching, I'm gonna look at what is the worst case pairwise distance. And then I'm gonna look at all possible matchings to minimize it. So let's say right now I'm gonna start matching and uh, you know through some optimization process, I'm going to match uh, 
these two points together. Okay, that's a first pair. And now I say, okay, now I would like to do is I'm going to look at this blue point. Where does it match? Well, it has roughly two neighbors. One of them is already matched. So I'm going to say I'm going to match here and then I'm going to match here. Let's say those are the three pretty obvious matchings you're going to get. Now the next one is to say, okay, I can match this blue point to this point, okay? But this distance is going to give me a really large bottleneck distance, okay? It's not infinite, L infinity distance. Instead, maybe the better choice is for me to create a dummy point coming from which belongs to the red persistent diagram, which happened to be the projection of it. And then that's my best matching. Okay. And then now I have matched all the blue point. What are we going to do red with point. the rest of the red point, which has very small persistence. I'm going to match also to the diagonal by creating dummy blue point. Okay. So, so these how, are not what's real that? Point. The, so this point that you added on the diagonal, it doesn't actually belong to the persistent so features. That, that's exactly what it is for technical reasons. I would like to have the freedom to create those dummy point, right? So once those dummy point are sort of added to the matching, they are sort of technically considered as a part of the diagram. Essentially, I'm kind of padding my original persistent, persistent diagram with a careful subset of the point on the diagonal to enable this bijection. I see. And it's okay to do that because the birth and death time is the same. So it's like that feature never existed. Exactly. Because it's a, well, it's a feature, but kind of born and die at the same time. So it has zero persistence. So it doesn't affect any downstream analysis. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. This is really a technical reason why we want to do this to precisely address your question. What if I have persistent diagram that don't have the same number of points, how do I do this matching, right? And that's one reason for it is to add points on the diagonal. And the second thing is precisely I just showed you is that sometimes matching to the diagonal give me a smaller distance than matching like among each other. Got it. Yeah, so mm -hmm. you can also, this is also a very good example of imagining why bottleneck distance is actually not ideal in some cases. I mean, it is a distance, that means it has nice properties, but here is an example I would say that's kind of not so great is that if I have one diagram that is here and I have another diagram that is here, okay? If I do a bottleneck distance matching, the best matching is going to say, okay, I'm going to match those two. But you know that this third red point, it has no candidate off the diagonal any longer. So the only thing you can do is to match to the diagonal. Okay. And now this, this distance here now dominate my bottleneck computation because it's only looking at the worst case pair, right? And then in this particular case, no matter how I do, this is going to be the worst case distance. Okay. So, okay, so so that's why this is great. I'm actually ahead of schedule. I'm very excited. Um, is that when you have the bottleneck distances, there's another version of distance. In fact, I think the, there's still room for development in this space because when you compute distances between persistent diagram, what is a persistent diagram? They're just points you know, kind of in this, they're just points in this kind of quadrant, right? So instead of looking at just, you know, this bijective matching, there may be some other things which, which is based on what's called optimal transport. And then there's this whole area of research called optimal transport is really coming from sort of facility management, right? You have a bunch of warehouse, each warehouse has some goods and you want to transport uh, between one set of warehouse to another set of warehouse. And you can do sort of, you know, you can pretty much, you know, the persistent diagram can be imagined as there's two sets of points and this is a point from the first diagram, this is points from the second diagram and you want to do some sort of bijective matching. Of course, you need to create some dummy point uh, 
let's say this is a dummy point and you match to the dummy point and so on and so forth. And you know, one way to think about this kind of bijective matching is to say, well, if the left is a bunch of warehouse and the right is another bunch of warehouse, when there's a bijective matching, that means I'm just going to only move the goods from one warehouse to another with a single unit of goods. But then you can talk about trans optimal transport to say that maybe from one warehouse, I want to move you know, half of the goods to warehouse A and half of the goods to warehouse B, right? So it's kind of talking about transportation and what is the optimal strategy of transportation and so on and so forth. But okay, so there's sort of a lot of, I think, potential interesting direction of thinking about defining distances between persistent diagram uh, by allowing sort of one to many and many to many matching, right? So basically, uh, you know, I, I'm diverging a little bit. For the time being, I'm just looking at bijections. So, so before I do, so, okay, so what we just saw in this thing here is I'm, the stability is saying that, look, I have two simple show complex and I have a two function defined the simple show complex. And I perturb the function a little bit measured by L infinity distance. Basically element wise, the worst case perturbation is going to be the upper bound of my bottleneck distance. Now, what I'm going into is to give it a little bit more mathematical flavor, okay? So the more mathematical flavor is the fact that I need to define what's called a tame function. Really on the high level, a tame function, like if you think about the English meaning of tame or tameness, right? It sort of has a meaning to say it's kind of well-behaved, okay? So tame function here, it just means it's a sort of well-behaved function. Okay, so I need to define what this well-behavedness mean. First of all, I have a topological space. A triangulation of a topological space is a simplicial complex together with a homeomorphism between the space and the online space, the support of it. So what is a support? If I have a triangle which has vertices, if I have a simplicial complex that has three vertices, three edges in the triangle, right? The underlying space is imagine this piece of space underneath, which is colored by yellow. That's called the support of the space. So this kind of small piece of land that this triangle cover is what's called the support. But really what's triangulation is, is to say that, you know, I have a nice combinatorial representation of my underlying data. So what's a very uh, good example of a triangulation if you are in computer graphics, uh, a nice triangulation is a triangulation of a geometric object. Like for example, Stanford bunny, you have a triangulation of the surface. Okay, uh, vertices, edges and triangles. Okay, so sometimes people will use the word triangulation to go beyond triangles, right? You can sort of triangulate a solid ball into vertices, edges, triangles and tetrahedra. So, uh, you know, it's not just up to triangles. So a space, it's, it's triangulable if you can find a triangulation, okay? And remember when I have a function defined on my simplicial complex right here, you can define what's called a sub-level set. Sub-level set is just all the simplices whose function value is smaller or equal to A, right? So remember if I have a filtration, one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven. Those are the time where each of those vertices, edges, and triangles show up. Then F inverse, say, minus infinity three, okay, three is going to be all the simplices that shows up before or at times three. So it's one, two, three. This is a sort of what's called sub level set. And then because remember my synthesis is gonna show up based on this monotonic function, then I can say, okay, I have a sub-level set as a smaller value and it's going to include it in the sub-level set of a bigger value. So this is just inclusion, right? Because the next sub-level set just add more and more synthesis. And because of that, if I take the homology of those sub-level set, I have a mapping between the homology classes. And this is a quick review where you have this, you can define the piece homology group 
which is an image of the maps between two, between two of the homology groups. And then the Betty number is a rank of it, right? So this is a quick review of the persistent homology formulation. And what's happened is that a tame function is just to say that the function only has finitely many homological critical value and all homology groups of the sublevel set have finite rank. What it's trying to say is that, you know, each time I go through, each, each time I add a simplex through this filtration, nothing kind of complicated is going to happen, right? So let me define it more, is that, for example, if I have, and this is probably, hopefully I still have a little bit of time. This is the first time you're going to see a sub-level set filtration, okay? So if I have a function that has a shape like this, okay, this is my function f from real value to real value. This is my function. Actually, let me just actually do a bigger picture. This is a shape of a function, okay? And then this is the first time you're going to see what's called a sublevel set filtration of a function. Set filtration of a function, real value function, okay? And then I'm going to define sublevel set the same as before, but this is defined over a real line. This is going to be all the points in the real line such that its function value is smaller or equal to a. That's my sublevel set of the function. So what does that mean? If I, you know, if this is my function, how the function looks like, if I pick up a value a, then what I colored, those yellow pieces are the pieces of, or if I project it onto x axis, The green part is my sublevel set, okay? But the yellow part is easy for me to picture because this, this, this picture here is sometimes called the graph of my function. It's basically I'm plotting my function based on the input and output, okay? That's my graph. So the yellow part is a piece of my graph of the function that is below that threshold. So, what we're going to see in this case is I'm going to say that this function I just drew is a tame function, okay? So what do I mean by that? So if I start from say minus infinity, well, maybe I just start with some number that is below the smallest number of my function. Let's say I start with a zero and look at which part of my function is below it. Now it's empty. But the moment I pass through the global minimum of this function, what's below this function is just one single point. And then if I go further, the sort of yellow piece kind of grow, okay? So if I look at the projection of it is that or if I just look at the connected components of this yellow piece, at A1, I have one component that appear. At A2, this component just grows, okay? And now what happened is at A3, which is the second local max minimum of this function, another component is born. And, and it, this, at A4, if A3, this component just keep growing, both components keep growing. And then what's going to happen is at A4, can someone tell me what happened in A4? What happened to those two yellow components? Two components uh, merge into one. Exactly. So they now merge into one single component and then anything go beyond that, the component kind of still stays there. So what's happened to this? What is my barcode? My barcode is to say there's a component 
that is born at a zero, there's a component, okay, a one, two, a three, a four, a five. Okay, I'm just reordering that a little bit. I have a component that born at A1, sorry. I have a component born at A1. And I have a component born at A3. And the component born at A1 never dies. A component at A3 dies at function value A5, okay? So what I just showed you is essentially a uh, sub-level cell filtration of a one-dimensional function. And of course, I can also look at the, comp the projection of this component into the domain of the function. At the, this, at the beginning, there's a component that's born. As I increase, this is at a, A1. As my A increases, this component keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. And then there's a component born at A3. And then as, as increases, both component grow until they reached at A5, that's when this component merges with each other, okay? So if you look at the component born die along the x-axis, this is also exactly what happened for those components. But this is just example of what's called a sub-level cell filtration of a real value function. And the reason I say this is a tame function is because when I go through those critical points, right? In this particular case, when I say critical points, these are when the uh, derivative, derivative of the function is zero, okay? So this is a minimum, this is a maximum, and then this is another local minimum. Those are critical points. And one of the interesting thing about this is when I go through those critical points, you know, something homological has changed. You know, when I go through the first local minimum, a component is born. When I go through a second local minimum, another component is born. When I go through the maximum, which is a local maximum, those two components merges, okay? So a team function is to say that, you know, that there's only finite many of those critical values, right? There's only finite many of them, okay? So this is sort of avoiding the bad example, which doesn't really happen that much in reality if you have a function that sort of have like inf infinite number of isolations, this is not in some sense a tame function, okay? So really what's tame function uh, is trying to say is that, you know, I have a finite number of critical points and then there's sort of a finite times where my homological information is changing. So in a way that, you know, when I'm going through my persistent filtration, uh, there's sort of like only a finite number of interesting events that my persistent diagram is capturing, okay? But I'm going to end it here and then we'll start next lecture by actually uh, going over this definition very carefully, right? But really what the tame function is to say that essentially my function is pretty well behaved. It kind of avoid pathological cases like this. That's all that does. Okay, but once you have tame function, uh, we're going to kind of talk about a slightly different version of the persistent diagram of stability. Okay, so now it's basically defined over tame functions. Okay. All right, it's still bottleneck distance definition, but it's just, I'm relaxing a bit more over the space of functions I can deal with. Okay, I'm going to stop streaming and uh, any questions?